Welcome back to Goal Getters, a video series that looks at what it means to be a goal getter. You push forward in the face of risk, you go all in, you speak up, lean in and take your seat at the table because being a goal getter means you believe in seeing what you can do. Today, I'm joined by Sarah Baldeo, futurist and passionate leader focused on unlocking human potential with a dynamic background spanning founding consulting firms, assisting with IPOs, holding senior leadership roles. She inspires and empowers others to maintain momentum towards their goals. Sarah, welcome to Goal Getters. Thank you, Steve. What an auspicious welcome. Thank you. Well, we're excited to talk. I'm looking forward to, to getting to know you a little bit more. Would you do me the uh, pleasure and favor of introducing yourself, give me a little bit more background uh, about uh, you and some of your career accomplishments? Happy to do so. Uh, my career started almost two decades ago. Uh, and interestingly enough, I started as a neuroscientist. So I wrote my thesis in the very exciting work of cerebral cortex functionality as measured in functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. So that's a mouthful. Basically, it's the science of how do people make decisions? How do they behave? What happens in your brain? What neurotransmitters are firing? And really the engineering of why we do the things they do. So it's really the science side as opposed to the more emotive psych psychological basis of why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I made an interesting pivot early on in my career. I left the world of medical sciences and dissecting brains and I moved over to being a technologist and actually became an application architect. So my very first role, um, I was an application architect for a company that worked with one of the big five banks in Canada and designed a risk model algorithm. So since then, as you said, I've, uh, I've had all kinds of very nice, interesting titles. I've been at big four consulting firms, worked for some amazing technology firms. Uh, at one point, I was a chief chief privacy uh, and compliance officer. So really have played on the side of why we do what we do. How do you design technology in the best way to align with human learning? And then how do you make sure that it's compliant uh, with the legislation that has been issued by government agencies? So been on a lot of a lot of different sides. Yeah, that's that's a fascinating array across different industries, different functions, etc. But uh, always kind of coming back to, you know, what motivates people, what fuels people, what drives people uh, to to perform. So there's a there's a lot of commonality with what we're trying to do here uh, in in this series. So one of the things that we're talking about with our guests, Sarah, is about momentum and progress. And uh, even when faced with challenges and difficulties. From a scientific perspective, what fuels some people to progress and to be really resilient and adaptable in the face of those challenges, whereas others are perhaps not as resilient? Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, and I think most people would like to believe that we can all learn to be resilient. And as a as a neuroscience, a neuroscience kind of nerd first and the person that was a neuroscientist and still is. I always go back to understanding the engineering of the brain. So one of the things I share with people is mo most, most people don't realize that the majority of the human the growth that has happened in the human brain over the past two to three million years has all been focused on your frontal cortex. That's kind of the front part of your brain. Mm -hmm. And the brain's only really grown by about 30% in those two to three million years. But the reason this is important is when it comes to resilience and building resilience, your brain really relies on the left prefrontal cortex. And that left prefrontal cortex controls things like mood regulation, trying to find meaning in what's happening in your life, things like emotional regulation. Now, when you think about our instinctual reaction to some kind of a threat or something that may seem like it needs to, you know, require our survival, most people 
And un until kind of you grow and you learn or you kind of naturally build these connections and these neural synapses, most people rely on their reptilian brain, which is also sometimes called their lizard brain. And that lizard brain contains your amygdala, which is like your emotion center, your hippocampus, which is your memory center. So every time something happens to you that you think is a threat, your instinct is always to rely on that reptilian brain. The people that are the most resilient have learned to divert that instinctual response to, as you said, Steve, a threat, challenge, some something that has happened in your life that doesn't go according to plan. So when you think about it, it's actually the people that have encountered the most obstacles, the most challenges, their brains have really been forced to become more efficient. So instead of relying on their instinctual, emotional response that, you know, it's often called the fight or flight response. Yep. Yep. They divert their neural synapses and they actually build these neural synapses over time to engage their left prefrontal cortex. So, so progress then is about experience, sure, and getting as many experiences as you possibly can, as well as um, failing fast and, and learning from those experiences. Any other tips that you can give our viewers about you know, how they can coach their lizard brain? So I'll share a piece of information that most people don't necessarily like to hear. The human brain is very lazy. It is, it is a lazy piece of equipment, and it's actually designed to be more efficient. It's designed to learn how to do something and keep doing it. Why? Because you can. the more you do it and the more you repeat it, the faster you are. But what happens is because you become, like think about when you're driving home, you actually don't engage a lot of your frontal cortex and decision making because it just becomes habit. So when I talk to leaders and I talk to people that are decision makers that are trying to incorporate resilience in their own lives and help their teams to build it, I say to them, break your patterns. Break your patterns, force yourself to do things that are really, really uncomfortable. If it's taking a different route to work, if it's making your coffee, in an unusual way in the morning. If it's, you know, something really silly, like wearing, deliberately wearing two different colored socks. It just sounds like such a frivolous thing to do, but everything that you do and you use your physical body to engage with, that's all tied to your central nervous system. Yeah. And the more you push your brain out of its comfort zone and you actually get it comfortable with discomfort, you're preparing it. You're actually what's called priming it to be resilient. So yeah. I always say to people, you know, it's always easy to do things that you're really great at. It's always easy to connect with people that understand the same things you do. If you're a finance person, if you're connecting with finance people, you get this little burst of dopamine whenever you talk to them and you say, ah, I know you, I know your lexicon, I know the verbiage. But if you push yourself to connect with people, and to do things and activities that are really uncomfortable for you, you're building out a foundation of resilience for the future. It's amazing how how common those themes are. We've I, we've heard that repeatedly. You know, mm -hmm. pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, uh, getting out of uh, your your common circle, and really getting you know making a point to. Uh, connect with and build networks outside of your existing uh, network. So there's a lot of commonality there. How do you balance your goals at work and with your team with and, and balance momentum between both? I mean, you've achieved a lot. I am a consummate list maker. So uh, I usually, and, and this sounds funny to a lot of people when I explain it, um, I have a matrix at every, every beginning of every year, I don't have New Year's resolutions. I build a matrix. Um, I use something called List Maker. It's an app that I use. And I just build a matrix and I say, what are the five to 10 objectives that I want to achieve this year? How do they tie to my values? How do they tie to my sense of worth as a human being? And then I actually do a bit of a kind of like a night box. So I place them, <laughs> I place them along the value chain. And that helps me prioritize because I freely admit my biggest struggle 
is saying no. Mm -hmm. So if I'm asked, hey, do you, do you want to be on an episode of this really cool show on Netflix? I really want to say yes, because my, you know, my ego is excited and it sounds exciting. Uh, or if I'm asked to do a keynote or if I'm asked to contribute from a social impact perspective, it's really hard for me to say no. But one of the most important things that I learned, I would say early on in my career, is that saying no helps me to be very targeted in what I'm doing. And if I just say yes to all of the opportunities that are, are being offered to me that I'm so grateful for, I'm actually doing a disservice to myself. Yeah. And I'm probably doing a disservice to the people that I'm trying to provide value for. So then you're taking that rubric, that matrix <laughs> that you build at the beginning of the year and looking at every quarter, every month, every week and prioritizing your activities against that uh, that matrix, right? I, I do it every week. So on a Sunday afternoon, it's not the most fun thing to do, but I, I specifically believe for people that you know are ambitious, yeah. And they feel that that's, that's just an adjective that encapsulates their identity. They need to do that because otherwise they get very distracted and they lose sight of, you know, why have I committed to achieve X, Y, C objective by the end of the year, by the end of the week. So I actually do it on a, I do it on a weekly basis on a Sunday afternoon and it helps me to just have a lens of being very targeted over the work week on and, and it's not always work related it could mm -hmm. be i really need to journal today i need to journal at least for 15 minutes every day or i need to sleep because i freely admit that i do not sleep at all and i think when you think about these ties of resilience and productivity and also the ability to build a life for yourself beyond what is the status quo, you have to be very organized. And being organized doesn't sound the most spontaneous and, and exciting as you're going after these big lofty goals. But organized people achieve their goals. So how do you main, maintain momentum, right? So it's, you know, it can be a, a tough slog to meet those audacious big goals that you've set for yourself at the uh, at the beginning of the year. How do you how do you maintain momentum? How do you bring your entire team along? How do you bring in a, an organization along? What's the secret to your success? So there's something I usually share with, with my mentees, with my employees, with my team, and even you know with other leaders that are my peers. And I say to them, my value, if I'm only achieving my goals and I'm not enabling other people to achieve their goals, then I have failed as a leader. So at the beginning of every meeting, and there's there's tons of them, right? There's you're on a million teams meetings a day. I always ask every single meeting, what is it that you, audience, peers, employees, whoever is the audience, what do you want from me? There is something that you want to get out of this meeting. Let's be very clear what that is, what that deliverable outcome is. And sometimes it shocks people a little bit because I do away with the social niceties very, I have social ni niceties at the end of my meeting. So mm -hmm. at the beginning of the meeting, I establish this is the framework for what you want to get from me and what I'm contributing to this meeting. And I use the end five to 10 minutes of the meeting just to catch up and be social. So I usually s kind of flip the social structure of meeting a little bit. Yeah, interesting. Um, so end on a high and end on a positive note, but but get really down to the uh, to, to the details of what you need to move. Um, so so let, let's kind of wrap up on in terms of goals. Then, uh, what what does it mean for you personally to uh, to go all in on your goals? You know, this year has been uh, admittedly a really really exciting year for me for for my family. Kind of a lot of the. I get this wonderful high when I kind of check something I love. I'm one of those people I like to just color code my lists and my rubrics and check them all off. Really for me, it means, will I have made an impact that is not just a social impact? I think social impact is very important, but is the data, is the information, 
is the deliverable outcome that I'm sharing because there's there's many different parts of my career. Is it changing anybody's day? Yeah. Is it changing anybody's life? Is it saving them time? Is it saving them money? Is it democratizing access to information? If there's not a measurable metric, then it doesn't align. Is there a particular passion project you're working on that uh, we should hear about? <laughs> uh, there, There is. There is. I am actually writing a book on the mm. neuroscience of resilience. That is the title of the book, which is really well aligned <laughs> to, what, <laughs> to, what, to what we're talking about today. When should we expect to see that? How, how far we, along? We can hope for early 2024. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, the reason why I decided to kind of push forward and work with my publications team and my publicist team on bringing that to fruition was so many people will ask me, can you explain to me why I'm feeling the way that I do about my career? Can you explain to me why I'm, you know, maybe not really passionate about a project? And what's the science behind that? Because I find that when people have a tangible scientific explanation for what they're feeling and what's happening to them, they feel in control. And if the biggest thing that I can do is to give people that sense of control over the trajectory of their career, their life, relationships, whatever, whatever it is, whatever path they're on, I think that's meaningful. That's I think that's too. useful. Yeah, I agree too. And and as well, if there's, I'm not suggesting what you might write in your book, but if there's some practical <laughs> tips in there as well yeah. that people can apply, like you've shared with us today, that could be. Uh, a really worthwhile uh, project and, and a really valuable read for people. Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I think my frontal cortex has grown at least <laughs> a percent or two in the past few minutes. So I really appreciate that. You've given me a few tips of when to not engage my lizard brain, uh, which I really value. And I'm really looking forward to your book coming out in, uh, in 2024. So I'll keep an eye out for that. Thanks for being a go-getter with us, Sarah. Um, Wish you all the very best of success. Take care. Thanks so much, Steve. Take care.